Now, these next few verses I wanted to touch on, but I didn't want to kind of go on the micro level on each one of them. But, but they're important enough that I wanted to make sure that we get through them, okay? So this is Genesis chapter 17, verses 16, 17, and 18. Okay. Let's look here. And I will bless her. So this is talking about sorry, we're jumping forward. Okay, we skip some verses, guys. And also I have given, I have appointed from her for you a bane, a son. When I bless her, she will become to the nations as she will. Sorry, sorry, sorry. She will. Uh, yeah, she will be, or she will become for the nations as malchei amim, as kingdoms of peoples. And then, because this isn't written in the text, but because is implied, mimena from her yihu, they will come into being. Verse 17, they pull Avraham Then Avraham fell upon his face and he cried out. And he said, Bilibo in his mind, literally in his heart. So he's thinking this. So he's thinking this. When it says he said in his heart, it means he's thinking this. He's not saying this to God, he's not challenging God. He's challenging his own perception. And this is something that's important. This is something we can really learn from Abraham here. We actually should be in the practice of this. So have any of you ever been around some uh, wild charismatics, right? So I'm not talking about just, you know, uh, I'm not talking about just, uh, what are they called? The assemblies of God or, or I'm not talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the Pentecostal, various Pentecostal denominations. I'm talking about, wild charismatics have you ever gone to a wild charismatic congregation or you know in a wild a wild charismatic and they just are always like a lot of the people are always always involved in prophecy or there's some kind of thing like major thing happening right it's always very very directed it seems right so a lot and, and the pitfall for some people i'm not saying everybody in those denominations right some people, they can handle it well. They can navigate that well. But a lot of people, they end up kind of left behind and they make mistakes in their lives because they get to the point of either seeking experience so much that they want to experience God. They want to feel him. They want the power of the spirit to manifest the tongues in them, right, during worship or whatever, that they stop developing their filter mode, right? Basically learning how to determine what is from God and what is just the mind? What is just the body doing? What is it that just the body wants to do? It, it, it even reminds me a little bit. There's a, you know, in the, again, in our Nach readings, there's a verse recently where Yeshua HaMashiach, he talks about, he says, don't be like the ethnoi in the Greek. Don't be like the Greek, the, the pagan, the, not pagan. Don't be like the Gentiles. Back then, those are Gentiles. The ethnic, an ethnic, right? In Greek, ethnos, this means a Gentile, a nation, a goy. Don't be like the goyim, he's saying. Because they think that their, their babbling in prayer will be heard by God, right? Like babbling, or some say it means repeating the same thing many times, you know. Many times. Have you ever heard tongues and you just know it's not really tongues before? I mean, look, we know that tongues exist. The scripture talks about it, right? But there's a real thing and there's a counterfeit. And I think what happens is there's a danger when people seek after experience so much that they themselves can get caught up. They can convince themselves that something is from God when really it's not. I remember Brother Tony shared one time about in Hinduism, there's there's a moment when they speak in tongues. It's, uh, what's the spirit called? The Kad Kadulini spirit or I think it's Kadulini spirit. Maybe someone can correct me if you know, right? So. And the Mormons, some Mormon groups, they also allegedly speak in tongues, right? You know, supposedly. And so don't misunderstand me, Rabotai. I'm not attacking the true manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which can happen and be manifested through a true speaking in tongues, okay? I believe this happens, right? I know this happens. But what I am warning against 
is allowing, yeah, Kundalini, thank you, Tony. Yeah, the Kundalini spirit, right? So there's this, there's this danger out there that that can actually come to people and they can get involved in this kind of soothsaying even that happens. I mean, have you ever noticed some of the prophecies from the great, from the big charismatic teachers that are out there? You know, the, I remember one guy, he prophesied that Donald Trump would win again. This is a big name. I don't want to say his name. Because, you know, the guy's done a lot of good stuff, and uh, but very famous on Christian television. And he said that Donald Trump was going to win again, right? But that did not happen, friends. Right? This is a false prophecy. And many of them are prophesying that same thing, piling on board. And so it makes it, it really should, if you're, if you're a reasonable person, if you wrestle with the word and you wrestle with God, it should make us question, are these guys really ever prophesying? Again, I'm not throwing in all charismatics. Do not misunderstand me, okay? A lot of them are very good brothers. They love the Lord. They love God's word. You know, they're learning and they're growing as we're all growing. And we all make mistakes, right? So this is not casting, you know, not to throw that entire denomination, or they like to call themselves non-denominational, whatever, under the bus, okay? But you need to open your eyes because many people in alcohol come from these backgrounds. And, you know, uh, and even not in alcohol, at other... I've been at other, uh, I've been at Hebrew Roots places before, and someone walks up to me after service, and I'm shaking their hand, right? And they say, They're talking to me in tongues. That is inappropriate. That is ridiculous. It's like what I wanted to say, you are a cartoon character, sir. You know, what are you doing talking to me in tongues? Where did you learn? Where is your Musar? You know, where did the scripture teach you to do this? That's not what tongues is for. Tongues are for in the privacy of your own closet, prayer closet. Yeshua talks about it in, in, in Matthew, I think it's 6. He talks about going into the inner place. He says, don't be like the Goyim who repeat themselves repeatedly or who babble. He says, don't be like the ethnoi who do this. Instead, when you pray, go into the inner sanctum of your house. Go into the, uh, the Greek word actually means the storage room, like where the treasure was kept, like the safe was in the house, right? You know, but you know, this is interpreted in modern days as closet, right? That's fine. You go somewhere where there's nobody at. And when you're praying, if the gift of tongues is appropriate for you, if that is what God has declared for, for you to have, then it might move on you. Maybe the spirit moves on you when you pray in tongues, right? No, there's nobody around. It's just you and God. You're praying to him the things that you were not able to express. You didn't have the right words. And instead, the Holy Spirit is helping the person to pray. This is not something that must happen with people. Like these other denominations, they, they make it almost a requirement to see if the person is really holy or not. When Rav Shaul himself warns us, that, you know, he says, look, you know, not everyone will speak in tongues, right? But the very behavior that he warns about, do not pray in tongues in front of other people unless there is also someone with the gift of interpretation. That's who's going to interpret the angelic tongue into English, okay? How often does that happen? I mean, very often people are just, they're all blah, 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 just doing their thing in tongues. It's just like pandemonium and chaos. This is not Torah Hashem. This is not the Derek Eretz. It's not the right way to do things. I say sometimes it is the Kundalini spirit that Brother Tony shared about. Sometimes it just feels bad when it's happening. I tell you, I felt weird when the person came up and shook my hand. It's like, really? <laughs> you know, it's Shabbat. I didn't want to make him feel bad. But it's like, this is so beyond the pale ridiculous. If you do this, you need to stop. Okay, I'm not saying if you have the gift of tongues and God moves on you to pray, right? But what I'm saying is you don't walk up and babble tongues in somebody else's face, okay? It's ridiculous, childish, childish behavior, okay? All right. So here we have kind of the opposite is happening with Avram. And here in verse 17, it's really interesting where it says, Amar Belibo. He's thinking God just said something to him, and he's thinking now, right? This is why Grisanides is saying maybe he didn't want any other distractions. Remember, Grisanides previously commented on the, that uh, Avraham, you pull al panav, right? He's fallen down on his face, right, on the other verse. So similar sort of thing here is happening. He's cutting out the external stimuli, and he's thinking. He wants to behave properly for God. He wants to interpret properly, and he doesn't want to offend God. 
So he thinks, it says he's thinking, he thought, and now here's the thing. This ha is a question. Ha? Question mark? Question mark? Or like in Espanol, the upside down one. Will Leven me ashama yi valed? Will there be a son at a hundred years that she'll be born? And he's thinking now, Sarah, who is 90 years old, will she give birth? Right, here's another, here's the question. Ah, uh, he's asking a question. Ah, uh, he's asking himself. Remember we talked about thinking is asking. You're asking yourself and you're answering yourself. You're asking. So first, Hashem says this thing to him. Avram falls down on his face. And he cries out, but it's interesting, but not openly. What is he crying out? So probably went, ah! But then, by Yomer Bilibo, he says in his heart, literally is what the text says. In Hebrew, that means he's thinking in his mind, right? It's that inner dialogue that we have. That's what this means here. He's not crying out all of this, right? Maybe he had anguish. He's like, oh my gosh, I don't understand. But he's thinking, he's checking out first. He's filtering the content. He's trying to properly understand, is this what God is saying? Is God really saying, blah, 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 blah. Or is he saying something else to me? Is he saying something else? And verse 18 follows up. Now, Vayomer Avraham. Vayomer Avraham el Elohim. Now, Avraham. I would translate that now, or then Avraham said unto the God. Right? So he, he did this thought. He received something from God. He processes and filters it to make sure it makes sense. For us, this means we're checking it out with Torah, right? We're testing it. Testing the spirit, you could even say, is it really from God or is it something else? Or am I misunderstanding? Now, once you've done that, now we respond to God with respect. Right? So he's thinking maybe he misunderstood, right? He says, perhaps, Lou is like, perhaps, or maybe, or can it be that Yishmael, Yichyeh, that he will live, sorry, not Yichyeh, Yichyeh, I misread it before, that he will live before you. Let him live before you. Let him be the one. You see the nice pattern here with Avraham, what he's doing? He receives, he processes it, and so that he's careful how to respond to Hashem. And then he thinks he's got it, and he goes ahead and says to Hashem, maybe it's that Ishmael will be the one before you, right? Is that what you mean? Because he's thinking, can it really be at this age of 100 years old, we're going to have a kid? But his faith is so great that he's still entertaining. Maybe that's really what God's saying. But he's, he's being careful. Instead of just expecting always a miracle, maybe it's Yishmael he's talking about. Maybe I didn't understand right. He's checking and making sure that he properly understands God. You see, this is a, a we can use halakhic exegesis to understand that this is how we should behave. Like our father, Abraham. Okay, yeah, before this, I want to see, are there any other comments or questions on that? All right, we're almost finished. Sit tight. I think we're going to end right at hour and a half. Not counting the Torah reading. So there's something else I want to share with you guys that I thought was interesting. One of the lesser known Aramaic translations is the Targum Neofiti. And Targum Neofiti does something kind of interesting on... Uh, at the very beginning of our Torah portion. And I didn't want to shove it in there. I wanted to do it closer to closing, actually. And what it says is, right here it says, um, and it was when Avram was uh, 99 years old, uh, and uh, Hashem spoke to him, Al Memra Vadonai, with the Memra of Adonai, al Avram, wa Omar le Anna Eloha. Okay, so he goes on to say, I am the God. He's revealing himself as El Shaddai, right? That's what's coming up. But this was what I thought was amazing. Neymar, the Neymar. So it's when God manifests himself, assume, Targum Neophyte, I think, is assuming that Avraham could see him. It's the Neymer, the word. This means the word in Aramaic. His word. It's actually his word. His word. His.
his word of and then the yod 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 is how Aramaic says Hashem. Sorry, Hashem. So the word of the Lord is the interpretation according to Targum Neophiti appeared and is the one speaking to Abraham right now. Isn't that interesting? So often, either literally in the text or through our Aramaic translations, the, the traditions that were understood right around the time, although not Neophyte is a bit later, but right around the time when Yeshua appears, the people were familiar with Aramaic interpretations, referring to the part of God that manifests himself on earth. This is known by the scholar Segal, the Jewish scholar Segal. He has a book called The Two Powers in Heaven. And this is not, this was, he's dead now, may rest in peace, but this is not this is not a messianic Jewish scholar, just a normal Jewish scholar. And Segal, in his book, he shows through vast evidence that at the turn of the century, so zero CE in this time period, that it was well established among various, various Jewish sects that God manifested himself as two powers. These are the two powers in heaven. Some would call this binatarianism, right? That there was there's the the Father God, who is impossible for humans to look at, right? So when the Bible says no man has seen God, right, or no man can talk face to face to God, and then there is this the part of God where He limits His glory, He restricts Himself and appears as a man or as a malach, as a messenger, also translated angel, right? Either one is fine. He appears as a messenger before people. And then people can see that form. They can see that outline of it. They can see that. I was discussing recently with, uh, there's a Messianic leader that recently joined our Nach reading group, yearly group, the, who uh, Dr. Dwayne Miller brought in. And the fellow's name is uh, Richard Cortez. He's a Messianic leader. I think it's out in Arizona, but he also does stuff in, uh, in Northern Israel. And, uh, Anyway, he, he brought this up, brought this to my attention, but we've mentioned this before too, the, the idea that the, the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, it talks about emanations from God, the big emanations. And I remember reading an essay from the late Rabbi Avner, may he rest in peace, who was the chief rabbi of our, or our organization that passed away last year. And Reb, Reb Avner, he wrote this essay where he talks about Yeshua being an emanation from God in the same way that the spherot are understood in the Kabbalah, right? That God sends out these emanations, these, these uh, attributes of himself, and they can manifest in a different way. And that this is, again, I'm not endorsing this. I just think it's interesting. Maybe someone will like this. Maybe this can help someone who's hearing it, who has trouble wrestling with the triune nature and all that kind of stuff, that, that Yeshua then is an emanation coming forth from God, right? And... Uh, yeah, and so that's interesting. And so it seems like this was what the understanding was before the Kabbalah existed. And by the way, I'm not recommending everybody run out and study Kabbalah, right? You know, our brother Daniel filters Kabbalah for us, kind of protecting us from getting too in deep, can share the interesting mystical parts of it and of Marchavat Judaism and stuff. But Kabbalah, it's one of those things where there is wisdom and knowledge in it. And But my rabbi, my Bar Mitzvah rabbi warned me, he said, he said, when I was interested in studying Kabbalah, he says, look, kid, <laughs> Kabbalah is only for someone who is a master of the Torah. And some, again, this is direction to me, right? And someone who's, I can't remember if he said 40 or 45 years old and married, right? And so, and he said, if you do not do those three things first and you study Kabbalah, you may go insane, right? So this is kind of an Ashkenazi take on it. So the Sephardim, are much more open to Kabbalah. And again, this is what, uh, what Messianic Minister Cortez said, that, you know, the Sephardim have been, they're much more open to delving into it. And that's true. The Ashkenazi tend to be more standoffish, although that's changing in these recent years. But the, the Sephardim, the Spanish Jews, the so-called Jews of Arabia, they are much more open to Kabbalah and that kind of thing. So, oh yeah, <laughs> awesome. Mike Tony says, awesome. Yeah, and Dan says, no wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, no wonder uh, I'm so ignorant on Kabbalah. <laughs> Yeah, so I prefer to get my Kabbalah from other people who have filtered it, and <laughs> I'd rather not go crazy yet. 
<laughs> in case my rabbi <laughs> was prophesying. <laughs> All right. So this is why we see these. I think this is why we see these manifestations of God in the form of Malach Hashem throughout the Tanakh, right? And also sometimes clarified in the Targumim, right? That this was Memra. And this is why the first century community, when Rav Yochanan, when the, the disciple John writes his Besora, his gospel, he's able to say that in the beginning, la, 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 and the word became flesh, right? The word, that's the Memra in Aramaic. Memra, the ah at the end means the in Jewish Aramaic. So Memra, the word, the Memer. The Memer also called Dibura, the Dibur, right? The, the, the word became flesh. Because Jews in those days who only knew Aramaic, those who didn't know Hebrew well, would have been accustomed to reading the Targum. In fact, we're told in the Talmud that in the synagogue, the Hebrew should be read and the interpret the translation should be read as well, right? So you're supposed to read the Torah and you're supposed to read it also. Traditionally, this is interpreted as in Aramaic, right, in Targum. So like if you get an Orthodox Chumash, I used to have a nice leather one. I don't know what happened to it. It has Hebrew on one part and then very small next to it you'll find a targum sometimes there's more targumin but you know usually there's just one tar usually targum onkelos right because that's the most literal one he does the least amount of interpretation right and so you read it in the hebrew and then you read the aramaic also because orthodox jews tend to be better at he at aramaic than they are at hebrew rather they're more often dealing with aramaic because the gemara the commentary in on the mishnah it's written in aramaic in jewish aramaic and so you know, as well as the Targumim, right? So, of course, they know Hebrew as well, but the Aramaic is more comfortable because they're more often swimming in Aramaic, the yeshiva bulkers, the guys that are the yeshiva all the time. Right. Any comments or questions? And we're about to finish up. Sit tight. There's time check. I did the time check. <laughs> so we talked about circumcision today. So here I've copied from the ESV. That's why you'll see words like churches and stuff. You know, uh, First Corinthians, the letter to First Corinthians, chapter seven, verses seventeen to twenty. All right, because I think these are important to ponder. It's good to be challenged. And it says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. And look, we could actually go into the Greek and parse out this stuff and challenge the translation. I think the translation is a little bit biased. Usually ESC is pretty decent, but uh, I think it's a bit biased here. But I want to just take it like it is, because many of you, you're going to be challenged by this. I've known Messianic brothers who were born uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Veris has great explanation. Thanks, Achi. Uh, who were born as Goyan and were grafted in, and later they got circumcised in their adulthood, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. I think there's something, the way that Paul uses language can sometimes be difficult to understand, all right? Oftentimes, when Paul says circumcision or the circumcision, I think it's useful to understand that he means conversion, conversion, okay? So let's let's try to understand this a little bit better. So conversion or being a member of the Pharisaical sect, let's say, all right, a member of the Pharisees. Because to Paul, for example, when he warns the Galatians about going through conversion, circumcision, or he talks about members of the circumcision, what he, I believe, what he means is those who belong to the sect of the pharisees in those days that particular pharisaical way of looking at things like he was right so he would consider himself a pharisee he continues to identify himself as a pharisee right he says i am a pharisee he doesn't say i was a pharisee right and we know that he keeps all of the interpretations of the mitzvot that that the house of hillel had okay so he keeps all of that 
as we're told in Acts, when he comes to the Jerusalem Council to meet with the brothers there, this was kind of the 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 the, the guys who were in charge of the sect of the followers of the way. That's us today, right? Although that term has been ruined by a weird Christian sex cult, <laughs> the way. So we're not that way, <laughs> but the followers of the way. He they say we know that you keep the Torah, we, you keep the, all the commandments and our traditions right so they're saying we know that you keep even the traditions paul right so this concept that paul somehow ever stopped being a traditional jew is just ridiculous because in the book of acts it's affirmed that not only did he keep torah but he also kept the interpretations of torah in other words our traditions all right and i believe that this is often what paul's talking about when he warns about circumcision he's leaning on the nuance of well, first of all, who's going to circumcise you, right? Because in these days, usually the followers of the way, they would meet at a synagogue on Shabbat, right? That's why we're told that they hear Moses preached every Shabbat in the synagogue, right? So they'd go to a synagogue. And then sometimes they would meet in, in someone's home, like a home meeting in the evening for, for the time Moti Shabbat, the time after the Shabbat, right? They'd go home. And so, and they and they discuss things like about Yeshua and stuff like that, right? So they're meeting in the synagogue on Shabbat with other Jews from other sects who do not accept Yeshua. They're doing the Torah stuff together. They're singing the Psalms together. They're doing the synagogue worship, and then they're going home at night, right? So it's technically Sunday now, and they're meeting in someone's house, usually eating something together. Maybe they would do havdalah together, right? They break. They they say, okay, it's technically not Sabbath anymore, and they keep. They would oftentimes stay late in the night with their love of discussing the Messiah and things related to him. And so for Paul, he's much easier to understand, I think, even if you don't get into the Greek and you don't get into all, even all the background stuff, to understand that when he talks about circumcision, yes, he's often talking about the actual act of cutting off the foreskin, but he's also talking about who's going to do that for you. If you want, if, say you have a whole new group of people living in Corinth, who were not Jews. They recently got saved. They've accepted the Messiah. And, and now someone tells them, some guy comes passing through who's also a follower of the way, but he's from a Pharisaical background. He says, oh, you have to convert. You got to become a Jew. This way is the way to become a Jew. Not the Ephesians chapter two way through the blood of the Messiah. You'll be grafted in all that stuff and his suffering. But this way, you have to do it the Pharisaical way. So what that means is they're, if they get circumcised through the predominant sect of the day, the Pharisees, it means that they have to make a vow to keep the Torah in the way that they teach, you see? Because as Yeshua says, they are the ones who were sitting in the seat of Moses, right? So anyone, as long as someone remained technically not a Jew in their eyes, and they're living in Israel, and they're under the Pharisaical rule, right, and the Sadduceeical rule as well from the priesthood, then that person living in the land, even if he was born a Gentile, if he's like a righteous Gentile, even though we would see him in the Messianic movement as someone who's grafted in and, uh, and, and learning the mitzvot over time, right? He's learning, he's adapting, he hears Moses every Saturday in the synagogue, and he's becoming, he's becoming a full citizen over the three-year period of being grafted in. If he went through the technical circumcision practice to the Pharisees, now he has to do all that other stuff right away, right? And of course, most of them did not accept the Messiah. So there's a lot of negativity. And I've seen this happen, guys. I understand what Paul is warning about. I've seen it. I've known entire families who were messianic, and then they went off the deep end and converted to Orthodox Judaism. Even when they didn't have like a drop of Jewish blood in them, they all convert to Judaism. They reject the Messiah. It's a real risk. And I think this is what Paul is trying to warn about. He's trying to warn, look, <laughs> God cares about what's in your heart. He cares about that you care to be obedient to him. Eventually, the time will be right for the circumcision, but it should not be from the perspective of pharisaical conversion. When he talks about the circumcised, this is technical language that Paul is using to refer to those who have either been... Are there any questions or answers on that? Let me try to get the comment section back up again. At the very end, does that happen? <laughs> Eric, there we go. Okay, good. I think we're okay, right? Okay, Baruch Hashem. All right, then the, if there are no questions, 
אבינו מלכנו, our father king, מודיעים אנחנו לפניך כי אנחנו יכולים ללמוד את תורתך היום הזה. כן, יהי רצון אדוני כי בשבוע הזאת יחיה באחות ממך משמיים ממעל על כל שומעי את קולי עכשיו אדוני. לא ממני וממך אדוני, לא לי ולך יהיה כל הכבוד. תודה לך אדוני, אנחנו אוהבים אותך וגם את תורתך. בזכות ישוע המשיח. שבוע טוב אבירואן. אמן. שבוע טוב רבי. תודה. Thank you. Very welcome. Remember, Monday is the last day to register for Hebrew. You've reached the end of our Shabbat Drash. Keep studying so we can find together more gems from his Torah. If you'd like to stand with us financially, you can make a monthly or one-time contribution by visiting www.patreon.com slash Hebrew Literacy. Tadah Rabah!